Hello friends and foes of Middle Earth and welcome back. And welcome to my own take on how a TV series about the Second Age should be like. Before we begin, I should talk a little about what this series is going to be like. First, I highly recommend you to pause here and watch the intro video if you haven't watched it yet, and then come back here. It will give you an idea what sort of series this is going to be and how I've tried to approach the whole thing. In short, I will not follow the same restrictions as Amazon had for the law. It was their choice to try and cover the second age, and I've already explained how that can't be done properly without the rise to the Silmarillion and the Unfinished Tales. Make sure to check out the law breakdown that will come out a day or two after this video. The law breakdown will elaborate on the law behind this episode, what things I changed, why I changed it, and also what other sources I used as inspiration. And now lean back and let's explore the second age together. It is said that in the beginning, the world was created in the great song of the Ainur, called Ainur Lindale. Eru Iluvata, the one, bade each of the Ainur to weave their own thoughts and ideas into the music, and he chose Manwe to be the greatest in authority and high king of Arda. But his brother Melkor, the most powerful of the Ainur, in his pride broke the harmony, for he decided to increase the power and glory for the part assigned to him. Much of the evil in the world was created in the discord of Melkor. Strive arose among Melkor and the other Valar, and for that time Melkor withdrew and departed to other regions and did there what he would. But he did not put the desire for the kingdoms of Arda from his heart. Milko built his fortress in the far north of the world, and in the dark pits he created many foul beings never seen before, and allied himself with other evils. For this he was named Morgoth, the Black Foe. During the first age of the sun, the free peoples of Beleriand fought many wars against the growing darkness of Morgoth. This culminated in the War of Wrath, when the Valar themselves aided the free peoples, and Morgoth was forever imprisoned in the void, a place of everlasting darkness, beyond the bounds of the world. But many servants of Morgoth fled from the final battle and hid in the dark corners of Middle-earth, lurking and preparing to avenge their master. Thus ended the First Age, and the Second Age began. To the men that aided in the war, the Valar lifted an island out of the ocean and gave to them. Elena, they called it, the land of gift. And here the first king, Elros, half-elven, founded the kingdom of Numenor. Here he ruled wisely for more than four centuries before the kingdom passed from father to son. In the year of 725, his great-grandson Tar Elendil ruled. He was a king beloved by his people, wise, with many winters. But something was about to change in Numenor. The new winds reached the shores, carrying the call of the Great Sea. We start out on the ship Numerama, belonging to Veentur, captain of the king's ships. On board is Aldarion, son of the king's heir, who learned that Veentur is his grandfather. And as they sail towards the Firth of Romena, the seagulls greet the ship and fly all around them. Tell me about it again, grandfather. I think I've told you all there is to know by now. I've only been there once, and that was more than a century ago. Memory fades over the years, I'm afraid. Don't you ever want to sail back there, to Middle-earth, to see the great havens of the elves, or behold the mountains along the shores? It sounds like you've already been there. <laughs> Sadly, I do think my greatest voyages are behind me, and not ahead, Aldarion. Well, if ever you venture there again, take me with you, for I desire to see Middle-earth more than anything. I am ready, Grandfather. Yes, yes. I've heard it a thousand times by now, my boy. Let us anchor and return home for now. Aye, Captain. As Aldarion leaves him, he gives him a look like he has made up his mind. Next we see the splendour of Numenor, and a great eagle flies above the ship towards the mountain of Meneltama at the centre of the island. Aldarion and Veentur sit and dine as we see them again. Veentur stops eating and looks at Aldarion with wonder. 
You have lived here in my house for many years now, Eldarion, and I regard you as if you were the son I never had. You govern the waves like no one else I've seen, and many times you have sailed from port to port here on Numenor. The sea is as much in you as in me, Eldarion interrupts. I've learned it from the best. And yet, I see the tenderness of your mother. Then to stands up and walks a few steps from the table and looks at the moonlit water. Beware of the sea, Eldarion. It has a way of swallowing men and their dreams. Then to it turns back and face Eldarion. Are you sure that you truly want to go to Middle-earth? Eldarion stands up. More than anything. Very well. Spring is drawing nigh, and also the day of your full age. I have in mind a way to mark it fittingly. My own years are far greater, and I do not think that I shall often again have the heart to leave my fair house and the blessed shores of Numenor. But once more, at least I would ride the great sea and face the north wind and the east. This year you shall come with me, and we will go to Mithlun and see the tall blue mountains of Middle-earth and the green land of the Eldar at their feet. Good welcome you will find from Kyrd and the shipwright, and from High King Gil-galad. And Darian hugs Veentur, and Veentur smiles. But you must speak of this with your father. Thank you, grandfather. I shall ride first thing in the morning. So be it. Two mariners sailing to Middle-earth for the second time in the history of Numenor. We shall ride the Numerama upon the waves, and share this last adventure of mine. The conversation continues and fades to black. Close up on the road leading to the tower. The hoops of Aldarian's horse is the first shot. There's a short montage of Aldarian riding in full haste to the tower of his father. Guards greet him and takes his horse. He is greeted by his pregnant mother and his younger sister, Eilinil. It's clear his mother is very happy to see him. Aldarian asks for his father, and we cut to the tower where Menelur is looking at a scroll about stars. The props in this scene indicate that he is very interested in stars and their movement. So you want to sail by spring, you say? As soon as the winds are favorable, Menelur sighs and puts down the scroll and turns around. He sees that Adarian is very eager, and behind him stands Almarian, sending him eyes. <sighs> Do as your heart calls, my son. I shall miss you sorely. But with Veentua as captain, under the grace of the Valar, I shall live in good hope of your return. But do not become enamoured with the great lands, Aldarion, you who one day must be king and father of this isle. Thank you, father. I remember your wise words, as I behold the havens of the Eldar, and greet the high king from you. Aldarion bows and is about to leave. You must ask the king for leave as well. It is no small matter to sail to the great lands once again, and it's more than a hundred years since Veentur went there, for the very first time since the founding of the kingdom. Surely the king will have a say in this matter. Then I shall ride at once, and beg for leave. Stay a little, my son. It's been so long. She touches his cheek. Just three days. Spring is going nowhere. Of course, mother. Come, Eilinil. Adarian leaves the room with his little sister, and we remain in the room with Meneldur and Almarian. Why do you look so grim? Surely this should rather be celebrated than mourned. Thy rukin yon kwan, an oyo quetise rie os ier. He is young. With time he will grow into the position which was bestowed upon him. Grant him this leave, and he surely will return a better man, suited to become king one day. He needs to let go of the sea. He is no different than my father. You cannot take away the sea from him. He drowns on land. That is what I fear. He has spent years with Vento now, and day by day I feel I know him less. I fear he is very different from myself. He loves the sea, just as you love the stars. You are not so different as you think. Let him be young for now. She takes Menelua's hand and places it upon her belly. Have you thought of a name yet? If it's a boy, the Arendur, like your uncle. If a girl, Almiel, the blessed. You're my greatest blessing. We caught Tom and lost the capital of Numenor.
We see Aldarion climb the steps to the king's hall. Two great eagles fly above the capital to their nest on top of the king's tower. Grand music plays as we behold the capital for the first time. As the eagles nest, we get the impression Aldarion is on his way to the top of the tower. You have visitors, my king. Thalindal turns about and sees Aldarion. Aldarion goes down on one knee and bows his head and with his hand on his breast. Grandfather. Rise, rise, my boy. Enough formalities. It's good that you have come. It's been so long. Come, I want to show you something. Aldarion stands up and walks over beside Ta'elindil. Look at this magnificent map. I just finished it this morning. I even made sure to include your father's tower. This must be the most detailed map of Numenor I've ever seen. He even included Ventus' house on it. Yes, yes. Though I must admit, I used a little from the first map made by Norlimon, my grandfather. But... Enough about that. Tell me what brings you to Amenelos. I haven't seen you since Eru Hantale, if I remember correctly. Aldarion is about to speak, but is interrupted. Your exploits are no secret to me, however. I've heard you have visited every port in Numenor. I assume that's why you have come. You want to sail to Middle-earth. <laughs> Your knowledge and wisdom is not exaggerated. You're correct, but I wish not to go there alone but under my grandfather's command. Ah, the captain of my ships. I envy you, my boy. I would have gone with him the first time, but the council advised against it. Ever have I wanted to see the green lands of the Eldar and speak to their king, Gilgalad. His wisdom is beyond my own reputation. But alas, the years have caught up with me. I must make do with the elves that visit Eldalonde. So have your blessing. Come. Tyler Lindell walks over to a corner of the room and grabs a sword on display. This is Arandruth. You know it belonged to my father and his father, and then Elros before that, first king of Númenor. But well, this sword once belonged to the elven king Thingol of Doriath, long before it found its way to Elros. It was his most prized weapon, and it no doubt hold powers beyond our imagining. One day... This sword will belong to your father. And then, Tylindel pauses and looks at Aldarion. Do you ever regret that my father will become king? Regret? He is my only son. Yes, but my aunt Silmarion is the oldest. Shouldn't she have become the queen? Hmm, perhaps that would have been the wisest. And yet the council would not have it so. But being the lady of Andunye... The greatest city on the isle is no small fortune. I'm sure she counts it as a gift not to be burdened by the scepter. Over the years it seems like a burden that gets heavier every year. Our people multiply and the cities grow ever larger. The towers ever taller. But doesn't the sword rightfully belong to her though? After all, Elros got the sword from his mother, Elwing, if I'm not mistaken. And not from Thingol himself. But Elendil smiles, perhaps a little proud to have underestimated his grandson's education. I gave her another sword, a scepter of silver and a ring. Perhaps it should have been the other way around. But your father is my heir, and will one day hold the scepter of Numenor in my stead. And so will you, if you return from your adventure. I will not disappoint you. But Darian bows with his head slightly. I'm sure you won't. In you I see something different. You are not like myself, nor yet your father. Yes, I'm more like my grandfather. My mother has told me many times. No, there is more to you than meets the eye. This sword will one day be in your hands. Maybe you will be the first king to use it. I am no warrior, just a mariner. Ta'alindil puts back the sword. You have my blessing. But take this with you. Hand him a book. Write down everything you see and hear from your travels. And then we shall talk about it all when you return. May the grace of the Valar guide you. The scene fades to a shot on top of the waves flying towards the harbour of Romena. There's an overlay on the screen saying Spring 725 Second Age. 
and Marian hands a bough of the tree, Oyolare, to Ventu. May this keep you safe and spare you from the wrath of Ose. And you, daughter, it is with a heavy heart I accept it, as this will be my last voyage, and may it be remembered for an age. Ventu places the bow on the prow of Numerama, and all the people on board cheer. Prepare to set sail to Middle Earth. We see the faces of Almarian standing next to Minaldur and Tal Elendil. The ship sets off, and we see Aldarian looking back with a smile on his face. Minaldur is the first to turn and look away, but Almarian remain on the quay as the ship slowly moves toward the horizon. The seagulls accompany the ship as it sails east. Here we get a minor scene where we are introduced to the three companions on board the ship, Voronwe, Ulbar and Henderk. I could go into detail, but it's not that important. It could in theory be something like we see in the Rings of Power, though I think it's important that we hear the names of the characters. Ventua shows up and gives them some chores to do. Ventua and Aldarion both look back on Numenor. They see it sink shimmering into the sea, and last of all the peak of Meneltama as a dark finger against the sunset. I'm certain that King Gilgalad will be pleased to meet you. Last time I visited, men from every corner of Eriado went to Linden to meet us. At the Grey Hills we spoke for days, about days long past, from when my great-grandfather sailed with Elros to Numenor. They have not been blessed with long life as us, but yet they remain our kin. But we were Eldarion. For not all men in Middle-earth are ill friends, nor do they wish to befriend us. Perhaps we should have brought some weapons then, unless you plan to hunt them with bow and axes. Let us not hope it will come to that. The bow should only be used for hunting, and axes for cutting down trees. I know, this is not Numenor, so things will be different out here. Always expect the unexpected. That's the advice my father gave me. The inter leaves Aldarion. We see a montage of the ship, setting through day, night, rain and stormy weather towards Middle-earth. We see Aldarion riding in his book on deck. There is no sound but the waves of the sea. Captain! Lan ahead! Kentirina! Aldarion stands up, and all the men rush towards the front of the ship. Viento is already in the front, and as Aldarion runs up next to him, he whispers, Erid Luin. We get some grand establishing shot of the ship, sailing towards the harbour of Grey Heavens. Kitten awaits them and greets Aldarion going ashore. Hail, and well met at last, Aldarion, son of Meneldur, and welcome back to you, Veantur, captain of ships. Well met indeed, you must be the one they call Kitten the shipwright, but forgive me, you speak as if you were expecting our arrival. I have, I have the gift of foresight though some might consider it a curse. Long have I waited the day where you, Ardarian, descendant of Ilros, would go ashore in the fair land of Linden, a star shines upon our meeting. Then this is truly a blessed day, for long have I wished to behold the grey havens and the ships of the Eldar. It is truly an honour to meet you. And I too have longed to return, old friend. It is good to see you well, and now in company of new friends. We welcome you, sons of Numenor, true-hearted friends of the elves. Here you may rest, as if it were a second home. Our king, Gilgalad, wishes to meet you all. So let my people help your crew with the ship, and I will escort you to his hall. Gladly. Lead on. Montage of the Numenorians, seeing the splendour and beauty of the Grey Havens. We see Hendurk eyeing one of the elf maidens playing a harp while singing. Voronwe slaps him in the back of the head. Ilvin guards open the doors into the king's hall. Standing next to the throne stands Gilgalad, talking to Pengoloth, the lawmaster. Welcome, men of Numenor. We thank you for your kindness, high king. I rejoice that you have returned, Ventur. A welcome return to my halls. I've brought my grandson with me, Aldarion. It was he who could not be held back from visiting your fair shores and deep harpers. Though it is true, you are the man who kid and foresaw would come to my halls. And now with the winds of Manwe, and upon the waves of Ulmo, your ship have found its port. It is an honour to meet you, your majesty. Arise, son of Menildur, 
Here in these halls you are my guest. I am eager to hear what brings you to our havens again. And so soon, how could any man refrain from seeing this fair realm again? But I beg your pardon, your majesty. It's been half a lifetime since I was here last, and my sails are worn to match, yet time seems to have stood still here. Forgive me, Captain. The years pass like wind in the meadows for me. You and your grandson may stay here for as long as you desire. I would like to know more about your journey, and what happened on Numenor since your last visit. I have many questions to ask. I too have many questions, High King. Of course and I shall answer them all, if I can. But the hour is late, so let us wait until tomorrow. I was unaware that your arrival would be today, and there are matters to which I must attend. Tomorrow we will have a grand feast for the brave marinas of Numenor, and you, Aldarion, shall sit next to me, and we shall talk like old friends that meet after long years uncounted. Aldarion and Vientu bows. Your hospitality exceeds your reputation, High King. There is one here at my court I would like you to meet. Waves over Galdor. I am certain Kirtan knows of whom I speak. Yes, follow me, Eldarion. We have much to discuss on our way. And for the rest of you, Galdor here will escort you to your chambers by the shore. I assume you have a keen interest in sailing like your grandfather. More than anything, though shipbuilding is another great interest of mine. Well... Then you have come to the right port. There are no greater shipwright among the Eldar, even if I say so myself. It was my ships who brought your ancestors to the blessed island of Numenor. And if it hadn't been for me, your grandfather would not be half as good a shipbuilder as he is today. Can you teach me? Aldarion stops as they walk up a stair. That will depend how long you plan to stay in Mithland. As long as it takes. Don't you long for home? You have already been gone for months. I can guess in your eyes it's the longest you have been away from Numenor. The sea is the only place where I truly feel at home. I beg you, Kirtan, teach me as much as you can. I will try, but not tonight. We're almost there. Greetings, my friends. It is good that you have all come to this council meeting. We have much to discuss and much to decide. Please be seated. Your Majesty, forgive me for asking, but where is Kirtan? Should we wait for him before we begin? I was just about to say, Lord Caliborn. Thanks for reminding me. Kirtan will join us shortly. He is currently escorting our new guest to his chambers. It appears that his vision came true. I have just welcomed Aldarion of the blood of Elros. But this meeting will proceed as planned. What news from the harbours of Fallen? Ilf Lord is about to answer, but gets interrupted. Surely the time has come to talk of more urgent matters. And what matters would those be, Lady Galadriel? We are in need of allies, as I have said in the past. What allies would they be? Amdi of Lorien has refused all my attempts, and the Sylvan Elves prefer to have no ruler at all. Who is left? I beg your pardon, sire. But why would we be in need of allies? The first enemy was defeated, but I know that his servants are still out there. Hiding in the shadows, and planning their vengeance upon all of the Eldar. I hope that answers your question, Orofair. Those are but mere rumours. Mere rumours for now, perhaps. But this residue of evil grows ever stronger in the east. Send out riders to seek it out. Let us prepare for the worst. Surely the Misty Mountains will shield us from any enemy from the east. You forget the gap south of Methetras. Our foes will no doubt go through it and strike us from the south. And what would the mighty Celebrimbor know of this matter? I thought you only had a mind for metal. That is quite enough, Lord Celeborn. Your wisdom is always well met in my halls. The misty mountains will shield us, but I will not forget your counsel either, Celebrimbor. We must prepare our southern borders. The Numenorians have returned to Middle-earth for a second time. I know them not, but you do. And so does Círdan. Surely this must bring hope to your heart. Círdan and Eldarion enters the home of Ilron in Linden. Ilron sits with a silver harp and plays a lament for the fallen of the third kinslaying. O kéret uduler in elath, o lasahili sa ilonath, i kuinet udunge o neras, a kuinat vilas amiveras. 
Punawa a Ivestath Afana, Anuirit e Kostat Ananga, Sisirion Yemu Iherkat, Minir an Ivir a Inakat. You have visitors, my friend. Elrond puts down his silver harp and turns around. This is Elrond, half elven, one of our most skilled lawmasters and healers in Linden. He is the twin brother to your ancestor. Oddly enough, I already know. Welcome to Grey Havens. By what name do you go? Well, I was given the name Anartil at birth, but I go by the name Aldarian these days. Then welcome, Aldarian, to my humble home. I assume you have been sent by the king. What can I do for you? I believe the king had in mind to answer some questions. He hidden bows and leaves them. Questions? What questions? I would like to learn as much as I can while I'm here. I've even brought my own book to take notes. I may never return to these lands if my father wills it. I want to know everything and understand this world. There are so many things I don't know that nobody on Numenor knows. Well, I shall do what I can, but not all questions are in need of answers. What would you like to know first? Well, there's one thing nobody talks about on Numenor. Could you tell me what you know about the war? Hope, you say. I see little hope in men. Men are weak and easily corrupted. I am afraid that the Numenorians are not as brave as their ancestors that fought beside us. Since the war, they have given up their swords, and there is not a single man among them now that has ever seen combat. Do not so easily discard friendship with the men of Numenor. We are in need of allies. Perhaps not all need to excel on the battlefield. Perhaps not, but we are in need of allies that can fight by our side. I have to agree with Galadriel. All the elves look at Círdan that enters the hall and takes his seat. I know you have your doubts, your majesty, but I am more certain now than ever that we are in need of this Numenorian. I trust your wisdom, Círdan. It has never failed to prove the wisest of roads. And yet there is doubt in my heart. Men do not look beyond the years of their own time, and we do not know when this evil will strike. I am not sure if we can trust the Numenorians fully. I sense a great conflict within them, and I will not walk in the footsteps of my father and blindly trust the will of men. That is not how this kingdom will fall. Do not blame the cursed. The evil they bring with them are not of their own, but of that of Morgoth. Why not seek out the dwarves? The dwarves of Casa Doom are mighty fighters and know the Misty Mountains better than any. Would that not hearten the shield that guards us all? That is folly, Galadriel. The dwarves care for nothing but themselves. And I'm sure that the dwarves would say the same about you, dear husband. I have to agree with Lord Celeborn. The dwarves are not to be trusted. Let us not forget Menegroth and what befell King Thingol. But maybe Celebrimbor here can tell us more about that. I am not my father, nor my grandfather. Why am I to blame for their mistakes? I did not commit any crimes. Oh, did you not? Where were you in all of this? Enough. I've heard enough. Times are dire, and we are in need of allies. Let us not squabble between ourselves. We will reach out a hand to the dwarves, and then they can accept our friendship or discard it as they tend to do. We could set up a colony right next to Casa Doom. And why would we do that? Why would any elf choose to live right next to dwarves? Well, there are rumours. There are rumours about precious metals within the depths of Casa Doom. The smiths of the Noldor would not so easily give up a chance to get their hands on it. So be it. You shall go to Casa Doom and offer the dwarves our friendship. And while you're there... You'll see if there's any truth in these rumours. I will go with you, if you allow it, sire. I grant you my leave, Pengoloth. And if the friendship would fail? Then we had best hope that we can handle this residue of evil on our own. So the servants of Morkoth are still out there? I'm afraid so. Some have fled to the darkness at the roots of the earth. Others? as far south and east as any could go, lurking in the shadows. But as long as the Elder protect these lands, the evil of Morgoth 
will never endure. This shadow is but a fleeting thing. All things come to an end at some point. I guess they do. I've never looked at it like that. Well, thank you, Master Elrond. You have already taught me things no one on Numenor seems to know. I will beg my leave then. May the light of Iarendil shine upon your path. Adarian stops and looks back. What happened to Ungoliant? Some believe she fled south. Others, that she was destroyed by Morgoth and all the Balrogs. So she is still out there. Worry not of such matters. Her evil is long gone from this world. A dark but fading memory of a very different time. And Arian bows and walks down the stairs. We see that Veantor, Kirdan and Aldarion are talking at the docks about ships. Aldarion is taking notes in his book as they speak. I see that you two have already become quite acquainted with each other. Kirdan seems to know more about ships than the rest of the world combined. It's a privilege to speak to him. Do I fear I won't have the time to learn all I want to know? You've just arrived. When are you planning to leave? In a couple of months, when the first leaves of autumn starts to fall. There's nothing worse than to be at sea during winter. I see. I had hoped you would stay longer. There are many things I wish to discuss with both of you. I'm ready to stay, if you are, Grandfather. I'm afraid it would displease the king. And yeah, if we linger for too long in Middle-earth. In that case, I would like for Aldarion to come with me to the Grey Hills, like you yourself saw during your last visit to Vientour. Of course, I would not deny the boy such a sight. Perhaps you should take some of our men with you. They seem to grow a little restless when not at sea. Looks towards Hendrik and Ulbar fooling around. Explain it to me again, Celebrimbo. Why are you planning to head west if we were meant to go to Casa Doom? Dwarves are notorious for their secrecy. They keep their father names from outsiders. Do you think they will simply allow us into their mighty halls and reveal all their secrets to us? Though, so instead we are headed for Erid Luin to... To what exactly? I have a plan in mind. We see Aldarion, Gilgalad, a few elven guards, Ulba, Hendek and Ruronwe ride to the hills. They dismount and Gilgalad leads Eldarion and the others to the top of one of the hills. That is a fair sight. Even to a Numenorian that has walked beneath the trees of Nisimalda. It reminds me of home, but different. Here you can see all of Mithland and the Gulf of Lun. In the far horizon lies Valinor. But I want to show you what lies east of here. Adarian turns around with his men and behold the long range of the misty mountains in the distance. Behold, Middle Earth. Waves of green grass as far as the eye can see. Middle Earth is a wide land indeed, and not even the very wise know where it ends. There are yet many places and secrets out there that not even the Elder know of. It is unlike anything I've ever seen on Numenor. But Arian stares for a moment. Why are you showing me this? Looks at Gilgalad, who is hesitant to reply. There is a growing darkness out there. I do not know where it is, or what it is but it spreads with each passing year. Long have the Elves of Linden felt its shadows, but we have been unable to counter it, even reluctant to acknowledge it. I need to find out what it is. I need your help. Why me? There are few here I would trust with this task. Círdan is one, but his fate is to remain in Mithland and aid our kin in reaching Valinor. I am afraid that you are the only one who can find this darkness. I don't think I can do that. And even if I did, find the shadow. What am I to do about it? I can barely swing a sword. Nor can any of my men, for that matter. We could teach you how to fight. But you do not need to overcome the shadow on your own. I only wish to know what it is, and where we might find its spring. But Arian sends him a worrying look. Even though I wish to know more about these lands, I cannot. Fear is often our greatest enemy. It is not fear that holds me back. It is my father. He does not approve of my voyages, and I am surprised he even allowed me to come here with my grandfather. Ever he seeks to restrain me from the sea, he would not let me return to Middle-earth. I need to stay on Numenor, by his side, and prepare to become the next heir. 
father to the island. I see. Beauty is a noble virtue to follow. Silence for a moment. If you ever do change your mind, you are welcome to stay. In Mithiland you can learn things that no one else on Numenor knows. But I'm sure you already know that. I thank you for your kindness. I hope to repay you some day, but it's my duty to follow the wish of the king and my father. But for as long as I'm here, I will learn as much as I can from Círdan and you, High King. You're both kind and wise, a ruler of the last fair realm between the mountains and the sea. Bows his head slightly with the hand upon his breast. We see Gilgad welcoming him with open arms. We see Eldarion sit next to Gilgalad and talk at the end of the table. Boron we'll sits next to Eldarion and speaks to him occasionally. Vento sits further away and looks worryingly at how they mingle. It's almost like he's one of them. One of the Elder himself. Vento doesn't answer, but it becomes more clear that he has some fears for Aldarion. Montage of Aldarion at the docks, speaking to Kirtan, working on a ship with him and taking notes. We see that the months pass as they continue to work. Gilgalad shows up and speaks to Aldarion as well. We don't hear what they discuss, but simply get the idea that he's there for some time and learns about shipbuilding and about the elves in general. The time has come, Aldarion. Are you ready? Aldarion sits and writes in his notebook, now full of notes from the past months. Ready for what? We are leaving today. It is time that we return to Numenor. Already? The men are already preparing the ship. Vento is about to leave. I cannot go with you, Grandfather. Vento stops and sighs. You have no choice. It is the will of the king, and also the will of the captain of the king's ships. We're going home. Vento walks on deck, and Aldarion follows him. I'm not going with you. I'm not going back to Numenor. Not yet. It is not negotiable. We set sail today. Then you must chain me to the mast of the ship. Aldarion, it is time to go home. Do not force me to take you with me. You know very well we cannot return without you. I simply cannot. And what about you, brave mariners, sons of Numenor? Do you want to turn home? Are we so different, you and I? Do your hearts not long to explore and see more of these fair and strange lands? Do you truly want to return home to the port you have seen a hundred times? Or do you want to follow me to the unknown corners of the world? To see the lands no Numenorean or Elf has ever seen before? To go where none have gone before? And beyond that, if courage prevails, will you follow me to the east of east, where no one can go further east, and where the rising sun will greet us through the gate of morning? It is a fragile dream, my boy. We belong in the West with the rest of our people. We are not meant to go explore every corner of the world. I will follow you, to the edge of the earth, and back home to Numenor, or wherever the winds blow. And so would I. And I too would sail with you. Then I vow this, I, Aldarion, son of Meneldur, son of Tal Elendil, we shall return. It will not be the last time the Numenorians set foot in Middle-earth. I promise you that, Grandfather. For in Middle-earth, I see a bright future for our people, both on land and at sea. We will return to Numenor, but not this year. Adarian looks at Ventur, who bows his head in respect. The men cheer, and we slowly fade out from the marinas on board the ship and at the docks of Grey Havens. And here ends episode 1. First I want to point out that nothing is perfect. This episode is far from flawless. I'm not a great voice actor, so I decided not to put too much effort into it, as that would just slow down the production even more. Despite all that, I do hope you enjoyed this first episode. The pilot episode of a series often sets the scene for an entire show, and I want to make it clear, I made this episode more detailed than the future episodes will be, so it will not be scene by scene. I will also do a recap video where I go through what happened in this episode. There might have been a few things you missed, so I highly recommend you to watch that as well. It will come out before the law breakdown, so expect a minor delay before the law breakdown comes out. The first episode in any show is rarely the most exciting one, but it establishes some of the key elements of the story. Who are the protagonists, and who's the antagonist? We've also met some of the most important characters throughout the seasons. We also see both Numenor and Linden 
which are some of the most important locations, especially for season one. There are a lot of setups, some that are more obvious, but also a handful of things that hopefully first will seem like a setup when we get to the payoff either in a later episode or in a later season. Hopefully the quality of this first episode will become slightly more apparent when these connections are revealed, so make sure to watch the recap and future episodes. And if you want to know more about the lore, the lore breakdowns are there. I don't think the first episode of a show needs to blow you away. It just needs to pique your interest to watch another episode. When I think about great shows like Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon, Breaking Bad and so on, it's rarely the first episode that hooks me. It's the first season. But if my interest is not piqued early on, I'll rarely watch the first season to the end. My point here is that some shows will first become a success down the line. Like it happened with Game of Thrones. I think it was first after season 3 that more people started to watch it. Another example is House of the Dragon. A lot of people expected it to be pretty bad. But after a couple of episodes, more people heard about it and thought it was pretty good. And then they started to watch. I think a second day show would follow the same pattern. Season 1 is not the most exciting season. But it sets the scene, establishes locations and characters, and what the main conflict of the story is. Something that I think the Rings of Power failed to do. As you can imagine, it's quite a lot of work turning a list of events in the second age into an actual story. I feel it's too easy to simply say what should be included without going into detail how to actually include it. I want to give you a quick example of this. So one line in The Unfinished Tales tells us that Celebrimbor tells Galadriel that he loves her. First of all, it's in regards to the Elisar and who created it. And there are more than one version of that story. So if we disregard that part, we would also know less of Celebrimbor. The way you lead up to this specific line could be done in probably a hundred ways. And that's exactly why I think it's more important to give some actual examples how a narrative could play out. I find it too easy to say that Celebrimbor loved Galadriel without the proper lead up, the location of the scene, and then all the other details not mentioned. Did Galadriel know this before he told her? Does Celeborn know? And how does he feel about that? There are so many fascinating questions and dilemmas adapting the second age. It's what makes it challenging, but also very interesting. And I actually think it's what frustrated me and many other fans that watch The Rings of Power, because you have a lot of interesting notes like this that could be done in a hundred ways, and yet they decided to go with none of it. And yes, we could talk about what they had the rights for and what they didn't. But at the end of the day, it's clear they used very little from what they had the rights for or changed it completely. And they also used stuff from books they claimed they don't have the rights for. At the end of the day, it didn't feel like an honest adaptation of Tolkien's works. So even if these episodes aren't perfect, I hope you can appreciate the effort put into adapting Tolkien's work into a second age series. Maybe you'll learn something new about Middle-earth and ask interesting questions about the world and its characters. I also highly recommend you to watch the video about the lore behind this episode. Here I'll explain the lore used for this episode. There's so much going into this, and I can guarantee you that you missed a lot of stuff. Even if you're a hardcore lore buff, like myself. I'll explain what I included, what I changed, why I changed it, and also a lot of other sources I've used as inspiration. Oh, and some of these sources were also used by Tolkien when he wrote The Lord of the Rings. Whenever season 1 ends, I'll also do a live stream where we can discuss all sorts of topics. If you like this first episode, feel free to support the channel either with the super thanks function, where you can donate an amount of your choosing. Any amount is greatly appreciated and helps me spend more time working on this channel. You can also become a member of the channel, join our little Discord community with discussions, memes, sneak peeks and much more. As always, thank you all for watching. I hope to see you next episode. Farewell till next time.